Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julie. And uh, welcome to everyone. I'm so thrilled to be teaching this series of classes on the matriarchs or on the Imaholt, the mothers. I want to begin by outlining a bit of what, we'll be, what we will be doing over the next three sessions. And then we're going to dive right in. So in Jewish tradition, we have four matriarchs, four imahot, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Um, Sarah, Rif, uh, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Um, we also have Bilha and Zilpa, who are not considered to be matriarchs formally, but are the mothers of half of the Jewish tribes, or a third of the Jewish tribes, I misspoke there. And we're going to be talking about them during this series as well. I think it's very important to uh, include what we do have about them and to explore their own stories as well. So given that we have three sessions and six, six women we'll be learning about, if we had, you know, an, a, if we had a year, if we had six months, we could go so in depth on all of them. But what we're going to be doing is splitting the sessions up a little bit. Uh, and today we'll be focusing exclusively on Sarah. She is, of course, the wife of Abraham and considered to be the mother of the Jewish people and uh, a very important matriarch. And then the next two sessions, we'll be doing a lot of work around Rebecca and Maya and Rachel and Bilhan Zilpa. So we're going to try to get everybody in in these three weeks. And hopefully this will be a taste for more learning um, that you may want to do on your own in the future or that maybe we'll do together in the future. But be that as it may, we're going to jump right in. And what I'd like to ask before I begin my introduction, um, we will be starting when we look at the source sheet, we will be starting with the second source. I apologize, it's going to be in reverse order. The second source from Genesis Rabbah, from Midrash Rabbah. If you are interested in reading that for us when we get there, can you please um, raise your hand and Julie will note that. And that way, when we get there, we'll be ready to go with the reading. So if you're interested in being a reader, please let us know at this point. Okay, no volunteers yet, but you can send me a private chat if you're willing to. Oh, great. Thank you, Mary. We'll call on you. Thanks so much. Mary will be our reader. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mary. And please just read the English when we get there. And when we get there, we'll indicate that. Wonderful. Okay, so we're, we're going to jump right in. So in our Torah reading cycle, we have, in the last couple of weeks, we have completed reading about Sarah. So some of what I'm going to say may be review because we just went over it in the Torah, but I'm going to give a, um, a 30,000 feet kind of view of Sarah and her story. And Sarah's lineage is actually not so clear in the text. If you look at Genesis 11, we hear about Sarah and Abraham's marriage, but we're not totally clear if Sarah and Abraham were relatives prior to their marriage. The rabbinic tradition assumes that they are, um, that Sarah is in fact Abraham's half-sister through their father. They share a father and not a mother. But the Torah, the way the lineage is laid out is not explicitly clear on that. When we look at the lineage, we hear about um, Abraham's, I believe it's Abraham's brother who has two daughters, one of whom is Iska, and Iska is considered to be Sarah. So, we have already this connection between the two of them, and then they get married in um, Ur, or Kastim, which is where they're coming from when they go to the land of Canaan. And of course, in Parashat Lech Lecha, one of the most important parts of that, and that's, that begins our um, story of Abraham and Sarah, who at that point is known as Sarai. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, Hashem tells Abraham, Lech Lecha, go from your land, from your father's house, from your birthplace to the land that I will show you. That land ultimately is Canaan, or Eretz Israel, and they're coming from Ur Kastim, which uh, is understood to be in ancient Mesopotamia. So Abraham and Sarah travel, and the commentaries, particularly Rashi, says that they 
brought all of those that they converted with them. There's this idea that Abraham converted the men and Sarah, the women, to Judaism. And when they were going on their journey from Orkastim to Canaan, they brought all of the nefashot, all of the souls, meaning all of the people that followed after them. Sarah is also known as one of the seven prophetesses. We have many prophets in Jewish tradition, but only seven prophetesses. Uh, and the others, uh, among the others are Hannah, Miriam, Kolda, um, Esther, Miriam. So we've got seven, seven prophetesses, and Sarah is one of them. And I named a few others. I didn't name all of them, but there is a tradition in the Talmud that there are seven prophetesses. And oh, Abigail is the other one, Abigail. Uh, and so she is really understood not only in the Torah, but also by the rabbis as extraordinarily important. She's considered to be a very righteous woman. Um, we have a very uh, famous idea brought forward that in Parashat Chaye Sarah, which is the life of Sarah, that she lived 127 years, and all of those years were equally righteous. What's also interesting, though, is that if we look at the actual text of the Torah, which since we only have an hour, we're not going to look at inside, we're not going to look at directly, but I'm going to give you a couple of citations now that you can look at on your own time. If we look at Genesis 16, and again at Genesis 21, we have a couple of stories involving Sarah and Hagar. Hagar being Sarah's um, shivcha, that's the Hebrew term for it. I, the best English translation I can think of for that would be servant uh, or handmaid. And I just want to name that those translations are deeply problematic and extraordinarily multi-layered. So let's just hold that as we explore this together. So in these episodes with Sarah and Hagar, Sarah, like many of the other matriarchs, is unable to conceive and is very distraught and says to Avraham, have a son with, with, my, with Hagar, and it will be as though Hagar's son is ultimately my son. Because at that point, a woman's worth was very much connected to her children, and any children that may have been conceived with, a, um, with someone in Hagar's particular social position would be considered um, as if they were descendants of Sarah. So very complicated power dynamic there, want to name that. Um, and as we continue to explore, I think we can honor the multifaceted nature of all of these matriarchs. So Hagar does in fact give birth to Yishmael. And because Hagar conceives, and Sarah has not yet conceived, Sarah mistreats Hagar in some way. Hagar then flees and goes to a place called Be'er L'chai Roi, and Hashem asks her there, who are you fleeing from and why? And Hagar says, I'm fleeing from the mistreatment of my, my mistress Sarah. And ultimately, Hagar is told to return, and she does return and gives birth to Yishmael. And if we fast forward a bit, in Genesis 18, in a very important scene, Avraham is told by the Malachim, by the angels who come and visit him, who um, we understand to be three men, but Avraham sees his angels. We learn from this also about hospitality and treating guests well, that Sarah, in a year's time, is going to give birth to Yitzchak. Yitzchak, of course, meaning he will laugh. That is Sarah and Abraham's son. And Sarah laughs. This is a very famous scene. Sarah laughs and says, well, I am 90 years old. Am I going to actually give birth to a son at my old age? Am I going to have enjoyment with my husband so old? I'm a woman who no longer has her periods. I'm old. I can't give birth. And so in the text of the Torah, it's actually a little bit amended so that Abraham hears that the only thing Sarah said was, how can I have a child so old? And it does not include Sarah's um, point about, may I have enjoyment with my husband as a woman this old? Um, and given that he is 100 years old. So that's a very interesting scene of like navigating what it means for this woman to be without children and then have a child. And then if we, Move to Genesis 27, 21, excuse me. Um, there is something going on between Yishmael and Yitzchak. We're not quite sure what that thing is, but whatever it is, it frustrates Sarah, and Sarah banishes Hagar. And at that point, Hagar goes out into the desert and doesn't want to watch Yishmael die, and ultimately finds a well, and her eyes are open to that well, and they drink and they're satiated. 
Um, and ultimately, they both survive, but there is still that lingering sense of Hagar and Yishmael being outcast, and especially given that Avraham does not want this to happen. After all, Yishmael is Avraham's son, and Avraham loves Yishmael, but this is the piece of Torah from which we derive that Sarah is a prophetess, because Hashem says to Avraham, listen to Sarah's voice, whatever she says, you shall do. And there was a sense there that Sarah understood that the covenant, that the breach, that the line, so to speak, the, the descendant, the lineage, would go through Yitzchak, not through Yishmael. And in our contemporary world, we can also have a lot of conversation, which we're not going to do so much today, but we can and ought to have conversation around the way in which Sarah and Hagar interact. And the reason that I think it's so important to be able to hold all of this is because one of the beautiful things in the Jewish tradition is that the adults and imahot, the patriarchs and the matriarchs, are not given these portraits of a flawless character and never having done anything wrong and everything was perfect and by the book. In fact, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> in fact, our matriarchs and patriarchs are understood to be complex people who make choices that we can learn from both for the good and for the not so great. So the final piece of Sarah's biography that I want to give us here is that after the Akedah, after the binding of Yitzchak, the Torah specifically notes that Sarah dies. And the commentaries ask a lot about why. Why is this juxtaposed? So some folks may have learned this with me in the past, but I'm going to very quickly um, bring in a drash by the Piazetsna Rabbi, Rabbi Kolonimus Kalman Shapira of Piazetsna, which is a city in Poland. He ultimately was interned in the Warsaw Ghetto, wrote many important works on spirituality and Hasidut, and perhaps is most famously known for Eish Kodesh, which is his, his series of sermons that he wrote in the ghetto. And in 1939, he writes a sermon on Chaye Sarah, and in that he argues, and this is a very important um, and very radical thing to argue because he is coming from a very traditional theological background, that Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moses, our teacher, deliberately edited the Torah to juxtapose Sarah's death with the Akedah, and did so because, the, because it was recognized that the trauma of nearly having your own son slaughtered, or shafted as the case may be, was so great that Sarah could not bear it and her soul flew from her body. And she said to Hashem, I cannot and will not accept this burden, I will not accept this, and I, I will not continue in this manner. And um, for folks who are interested, there, I did a um, class with my Jewish learning on that. It's on the YouTube channel, so we're not going to go into that so much now. But there are many ways in which Sarah is seen as both the most righteous, perhaps, of the Imahot, and also as a complicated figure. And we're going to look at both of those things today. We're also going to spend a little bit of time on a modern Midrashic work um, by someone I have a deep honor and respect for, Rabbi Jill Hammer. We're going to get there, but I'm now going to turn us to a famous midrash um, that is about Sarah, and I'm going to ask Mary if you could please read for us Midrash Rabbah Genesis. Mary, do you have the text, or do you need it on the screen? Um, if it's in the, if it's on that source sheet, then yes, I do have it. Okay, great. It's at the bottom. At the um, bottom, okay. Let me go down to the bottom. Okay, does it begin with, God said, Sarah, your wife? Is that where it begins? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and, and forgive my um, Americanized pronunciation. It's nowhere near as beautiful as uh, the, the pronunciation currently being used, but it's what I grew up with. So please forgive me for that. <laughs> <laughs> no apology necessary. Read as you need to. Absolutely. Thank you. So God said, Sarah, your wife, in Proverbs 12, 14, it is written, a woman of valor is a crown to her husband. Rabbi Aha said, her husband was crowned through her, but she was not crowned through her husband. Our rabbis taught that she ruled over her husband. In all places, the man gives orders, but here, 
Genesis 21, 12. In all that Sarah orders you, listen to her voice, said Rabbi Yehoshua ben Karka. The Yud that the Holy One of Blessing took from Sarah was given half to Sarah and half to Abraham. Said Rabbi Shimeon by Yochai, the Yud that the Holy One of Blessing took from Sarah flew and posted itself in front of the throne of the Holy One and said, Master of the universe, because I am the smallest letter, you took me out of the name of Sarah the righteous. The Holy One said, in the past you were in the name of a woman and in the end of a name. Now I will put you in the name of a man and on the beginning of the name as it is written. And Moshe called Hosea bin, bin Nun Yahashua, Numbers 13, 16, said Rabbi Mana, Sarai was just a princess for herself. Now she will be a princess for all the world. Mary, that's beautiful reading. Thank you so much. So I want to unpack this a little bit, and I want to offer us an opportunity. We'll take a few comments on this as well, um, and we'll get to have a little bit longer of a conversation once we get through both sources. But I want to very briefly unpack a little bit of what's happening there. So in the book of Genesis, if we remember back to the first Parsha, Parsha Bereshit, one of the things that God says after Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, eat from uh, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as is often understood in our culture, that that's often how that tree is understood. It's actually um, a little bit more complicated in the Hebrew, but after they eat from that tree that they're not supposed to, one of the things that, that they're told is that the man will rule over the woman, which of course, for those of us uh, in our current iteration, uh, in modern times, it's very challenging to deal with, right? Patriarchy is still very much with us in this world. Um, so we have this Midrash turning that on its head in its own way and in its own time and, and location and saying that, in fact, Sarah was an agent. The way that I would put it is I would say Sarah exercised agency in her life. There are several instances in which she does not exercise agency, um, particularly having to do with when Abraham and Sarah go down to Egypt. But there is this case in Genesis 21, 12 with regard to Hagar and Yishmael, where Sarah is in fact exercising agency and Abraham is told that he must listen to Sarah. So when we look at classical Midrashim, we have to just be very aware that they are of their own time, just as any text that we write is of our own. And at the same time, that a lot of what is in classic Midrash is very important to how we as a Jewish tradition understand our biblical ancestors. And just a quick word on Midrash. Midrash comes from the word Midrosh, which means to search out. And it effectively is a tool that the rabbis use to try to fill in gaps in the Torah text itself. I also believe that there's a lot of oral tradition that's in Midrash, and there are several categories of Midrash. There is what we have here, Midrash Agada, which is a story, story feels like a little bit of a diminutive um, understanding, though I would probably say something like narrative. And there's Midrash Halakha, which is legal. And that we often find in books of Numbers and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and there are lots of collections of halakhic midrashim. For our purposes, we're focusing on narrative midrash. So we also have something that's very important in this piece that I want to name, which is the question of the Yud. So both Avraham and Sarai, or Avram and Sarai more directly, are renamed to Avraham and Sarah. Um, in the book of Genesis, having to do with their changes in status and having to do with the, the idea or the prophecy or the proclamation that they are going to become the parents of many of a great nation. The great nation, of course, being B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. So both Avraham and Sarah have a Yud added to their name, uh, excuse me, a Hey added to their name, having to do with that name change. And so that's being brought up here as well. Um, and before we move on to the next source, if anybody wants to drop into the chat um, any comments that they might have about this particular text, 
We're going to take only a few because I want to spend a lot of time on the next text. So if you have any quick comments that you want to drop in, I definitely welcome that now. And Julie, if you don't mind reading just one or two, that would be fantastic. And then we'll move on to the next text. Um, as we wait for folks to uh, comment, I'll, I'll read something that came up a little earlier um, from uh, D. Rohr Strauss. Hagar and Sarah um, is one of the most difficult problems, Sarah's cruelty and Abraham's weakness, and the stories invented to justify um, this, Ishma and Ishmael's behavior. This has haunted our history through the ages. Comment. Thank you. Yes, it has. And I appreciate that being brought into the space. Thank you so much. Uh, Jody asks, what is the Midrash Tanchuma? The Midrash Tanchuma is a collection of Agadic Midrash. Um, and I believe it is from the early medieval period. Great. And Carol um, comments, this name change always intrigues me. We also change names when someone is very sick. Yes, and the name change, in addition to when we change names when someone is sick, it's also a deeply integral part of an identity formation. So both Abraham and Sarag undergo this identity change, and we do not see this with any of the other matriarchs. So this is unique to Sarah. In the next couple of sessions that we have together, we will not be seeing name changes. So that is a really important thing to name. No other comments at this time. All right, wonderful. We are going to switch gears. Um, and if you have your source sheet, I invite you to scroll to the top. And before we read, we're gonna read parts of this. We're not gonna read the whole thing. It's beautiful and we just, unfortunately because of timing, we don't have time to go through the whole thing in depth. But I wanna frame it a little bit. Um, this story called The Arranged Marriage by Rabbi, by rabbi slash Kohenet, Joe Hammer, um, is a part of a book that was published in 2004 called Sisters at Sinai, New Tales of Biblical Women. And anyone who may be familiar with Jill Hammer's work, um, Jill Hammer is a teacher of mine. I consider her to be a teacher of mine. I'm grateful for the work she does in the world. She is one of the founders of the Kohanet Institute, which does um, training, trains those who identify as women um, to be Kohanet or Kohanot, Hebrew priestesses. She's also very interested in the divine feminine, in the Shekhinah. Um, recently wrote a book on Sefer Yetzirah, which is a very ancient work of Kabbalah. But is very also interested and connected to something that we call modern Midrash. And modern Midrash is taking the Midrashic process. So taking the idea, filling in the gaps, exploring narratives, understanding character, and applying it to women and other characters whose voices we may not have heard in classic midrash or whose voices may not have been expressed as fully in classic midrash. So Sisters at Sinai, um, which is nearly 20 years old now, which is totally incredible, is Rabbi Hammer's exploration of biblical women through midrashic storytelling. That's how I would describe it. We're gonna be looking at a few stories from this book. I think it's just a phenomenal work and I'm gonna be bringing in a few other modern um, works into the next few weeks. But this is a particular way of exploring a biblical character and doing so as a way of getting at what's going on beneath the surface. What these are not, and I think that's as important to say as what they are. Midrash as, as understood especially in modern feminist midrash. Um, and this is also how I understand midrash writ large, but I should say this is not how everybody understands midrash, are not absolute. They are literary explorations. What they allow us to do as readers and as authors is to get a better sense of who our biblical ancestors are and to bring our own voices into that dialogue with them. So Rabbi Hammer is not here saying in this particular story, these are the things that definitely happened between Abraham and Sarah. Rather, she is using beautifully imaginative possibility to get at that. She is bringing in a lot of references to classic Midrashim, which I will name when we get there. She's bringing in references to the Torah text itself and exploring through her own learning and her own spiritual 
explorations, what more we can learn, what more we can gain spiritually from these texts. So it's a, it's a beautiful process of exploration, and it lets us deepen our own connection to our, our biblical ancestors, which I believe is also what Midrash Agadah classically is doing as well. So with that framing, I'm going to now turn it to Julie, and we're going to read the first few paragraphs, then we're going to pause, analyze them, maybe take a few comments, and then read a little bit more. We are likely not going to finish the story, but I invite you, um, if we don't get through the whole thing, to spend a little time on your own. All righty. I'm actually going to share the text on the screen in case that's useful for anyone. And make my way up here. Okay. This is from The Arranged Marriage from Sisters at Sinai, New Tales of Biblical Women by Rabbi Kohenet Jilhammer. Avram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all the things they had collected and all the souls that they had acquired, and they set out for the land of Canaan. That's Genesis 12, 5. And Sarah laughed to herself. That's Genesis 18, 12. The house of Terach, minister at the court of Or of the uh, uh, Chal Chaldeans, how do you I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> buzzed with excitement. Guests were due to arrive. The inner chamber was softened, softened by bright tapestries depicting local gods. Nevertheless, the walls echoed with angry voices. Terach was helping his son get dressed. Avram combed out the strands of his black beard and arranged the golden robe beneath it. I still can't believe I agreed to this meeting. I don't want an arranged marriage, certainly not to a product of this decadent city. The daughter of Nofet is a beautiful woman. Terach adjusted a deep blue sash. You'll like her. She's your half-sister. She is? Avram turned around to look at his father. I've never met her. She's the daughter of a moon priestess. Her mother and I were partners at a ritual lunar event. She's no legal relation to you. Avram sighed. Do you think a priestess's daughter is going to leave Or and travel to a wilderness like Aram Naharaim? He pointed out when she doesn't even believe in my God, I still don't believe I've agreed to move to that wasteland. The two men would have continued to argue, but a small bronze bell rang in the outer chamber announcing the arrival of Nofet and her daughter. Terach exited through a thick curtain. Avram heard his father's robes swish as he bowed ceremoniously. Other robes swished in return. Avram hesitated a moment before leaving the safety of the cloth cave. He held in his thoughts the young woman he had met on a hill outside the city. He had come out after an argument with his father, fists clenched, eager, eager to get out of the suffocating city, and there she had been. She was dressed like an aristocrat, although she was barefoot and had tucked her overshirt into her belt. Her veil had fallen backward onto her shoulders like a cowl. Her face was as bright and smooth as a citron. She was pace pacing with her hands clasped perfectly behind her back as if they were sculpted in dark marble. Something about her made everything else come into sharp relief. Avram noticed the sharp pebbles beneath her soles, the supple leather of the sandals hanging from her right hand. He asked her name and she told him. Then he asked why she was alone out there on the hill. All right, we'll stop there for one second. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, great, so we have the story. We've got an interesting, uh, we've got an interesting setup here. So what's going on here? There are a lot of things that I'm noticing that I'm gonna name, but I really wanna hear from all of you as well. And I'm gonna invite folks as I'm speaking to put things into the chat um, and we will have a conversation about that. So Rabbi Hammer here is, is creating a scene for us in the best kind of literary way, right? Like, I know I'm imagining this like regal palace in Ur and Nofad and her daughter are coming. And so what's really important here, we don't have Sarah's mother in the Torah. We don't have her name. That's not uncommon, unfortunately. So one of the things that, that um, Rabbi Hammer does here automatically right off the bat is names her Nofad and says that she is a moon priestess. 
And of course, we have no indication of this in the actual text. And this is, again, the imaginative exploration. Um, and if we get further into the story, we'll get a little bit more references to some of the Midrashim about Abraham smashing the idols, which does not actually appear in the Torah, that is in the Midrash. But we have this setup where Abraham and Sarah are meeting, and you can kind of tell that actually Abraham is not so interested in moving either, and he doesn't really believe that someone such as Sarah, who apparently is his sister, but not a legal relation. And what's interesting there is that Tarach says, not a legal relation, meaning that marriage is permitted between them. We, of course, learn when the Torah is given later that that is absolutely forbidden. Um, but for the purposes of our story and the purposes of the time and circumstance we're in, that seems to be okay. But there's a lot of reluctance here, and there is a lot of description of Sarah as a very priestess-like aristocratic figure. Um, there was an article, I'm blanking on the author, but there was an article written uh, in the either late 70s or early 80s that is claiming that Sarah was a priestess in some way that is obviously very not aligned with how tradition has viewed Sarah but it is something that has been explored. Um, and what's interesting here is the way in which Tarach's pagan practices, for lack of a better word there, are directly brought up. That Avraham and Sarah are half siblings because there was, a, there was apparently some kind of ritual involving Nofat and Tarach, which then brought about the birth of Sarah. Um, I am not an expert in these kinds of things, so I don't want to misspeak about how about how excuse me about how sexuality connects to religious ritual um but there's clearly a an explicit um implication that that is that is what's going on and so i wonder um even though we haven't quite gotten through the whole story yet i wonder if this is bringing up any interesting observations or comments and if so i invite folks to jump those into the chat, and then we'll keep reading. Lynn commented that, that it's kind of like a romance novel. Maybe the young woman he became enamored of out in the field will be the same as the woman his father has betrothed him to. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Absolutely. Carol commented, it seems that there's an attempt to distance Abraham from the sin of marrying a sibling, given that he didn't know her. And yeah, I think that's really interesting. And also because the lineage is not so clear cut in the Torah, but the rabbis assume that they are related. And in fact, Abraham does say that later on when they're in, um, I believe when they go down to Egypt, that um, Abraham says to Pharaoh, this is my sister, not my wife, as a way of making sure that he does not get killed. That's a whole interesting story we're not going to get into today. But yes, I think that there is that sense of distancing. Right. Uh, this is interesting. Judith says both Terach's name and Levan's name refer to the moon, Levana. Yeah, Exa yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. That, that is an important piece, which and, may be where she gets the moon priestess idea from. Right. And Aaron uh, asks, who converts Sarai to monotheism? That is one of those questions that is so important that we don't have a good answer to. And I almost wonder if she ever, we assume, right? We assume, we take it for granted that Sarah converts to monotheism. But we don't actually know that. Like there, there is that question that's lingering. That's such an important question and I don't think we get a great answer. I think we assume it's either Avram or we assume she just comes to it on her own, but it's, it's taken for granted in our tradition that of course she converted to monotheism. Uh, and Audrey commented that her, her, my understanding is that Sarai is adopted by Terach in the Hurrian tradition. Haran is in Hurrian territory. That may very well be. Thank you so much for bringing that in. 
from Lynn, we have learned that what we see as idolatrous practices continued among the Israelites all through the first temple period and obviously before then. This would include moon rituals still viewed as having divine qualities at the time of the Tal at the time that the Talmud was compiled as evidenced by this week's readings. Um, I think you mean the, the Talmud readings, um, probably would include all sorts of customs, including marital customs. Uh, yes. Andrew, sa Andrew says, this suggests to me that the father of both may be the source of the nature to follow Adonai and to leave the familiar community together. This seems counter to the traditional view of Avram's father. Yeah, thank you for that. All right, if you don't mind, Julie, let's read a little bit more of the text. Absolutely. Let me go back to the screen. Okay, you'll let me know when to stop? Yeah. So I'll just, I'll start right at where I ended last time. He asked her yes. name and she told him. Then he asked why she was alone out there on the hill. She snorted. If parents had wings, they'd be mosquitoes. I wanted to get out while I still had some blood left. Avram laughed. My father's gained weight over the years. He's more like a horsefly. The young woman offered him one of her dangling sandals. You could swat him with this. Her voice was gravelly, exciting. I'd need a soldier's boot, I think, Avram replied. He gestured up the wadi. Are you walking to the top? Why not? They passed pairs and trios of nibbling ibex with spiraling horns. The woman reached out to touch one. It did not move away. How odd, Avram thought. Animals always ran away from him, particularly sheep. They were very timid. He had a difficult time with sheep. They like you, he commented to his companion as a young ibex slowly trotted away. Yes, she said. It's people I can't generally abide. They walked in silence for a moment. What was your disagreement with your parents about, Avram finally asked. Money, a husband, a piece of land, a new dress? A dress, she laughed mockingly. Nothing that important. It was about the gods, if you must know. She looked embarrassed then. She shook her head when he pressed her further. No, I want to hear, he said to her. She plucked the tip off a nearby leaf. My aunt had the good fortune to marry a god, she answered him dryly. That is, the king desired her and sent for her. He didn't consult her first. My uncle was unhappy about it, needless to say. This kind of thing frequently happens to women in my family. It's regrettable. I might even happen, it might even happen to me someday. I am told that I am beautiful. It seemed unwise to comment either way. Avram nodded. The young woman went on. I suggested to my mother that deities should not be marrying human women when they have perfectly good demons and demigods to summon. King Nimrod does not need my aunt as a concubine, but she is a handsome woman and apparently he cannot get enough of those. My woman, my, my mother is an influential priestess. She regards my aunt's new position as a political advantage. In honor, she says, Avram's companion snorted. What a farce. She abruptly turned her face to where the waterfall sprayed a thin mist over the rocks. But we fight over money too, she added after a minute. I wouldn't want you to think my family was abnormal. I do not think King Nimrod is a god, Avram said. As the words left his mouth, he knew he'd spoken rashly, yet his companion did not seem disturbed. Certainly not. The woman pointed to the, ibex, the ibexes as they nibbled, and she smiled a little. Could King Nimrod fit food and feed her so smoothly together? He is not such a fine artist, although I understand he sculpts occasionally. My father also sculpts, Avram admitted, as the two began to wade through a low pool. He owns a statue shop, although business has been poor since I smashed his merchandise. She laughed from behind a clump of reeds. Was he competing with your, with your statue shop? Avram grimaced. No, he was competing with my invisible god. I smashed all of his statues except one, then put my staff in the hand of the statue that was left. I blamed it on a fight among the gods. My Great. father didn't believe my story, of course. He had to admit I was right about the powers of his statues. Sorry about that, Julie. I didn't mean to jump in right there. That, we'll stop right there. Thank you so much. Um, sorry for jumping in a sentence too early there. So this is a fascinating, this is a fascinating uh, 
interplay. So we still don't know who this woman is, but it's becoming clearer and clearer that it's likely Sarai. And what I think is fascinating here is that Rabbi Hammer is playing with the very famous Midrash about Abraham smashing the idols in Tarach's statue shop. And I love the humor, right? Business has been bad since I smashed all my father's merchandise. You kind of can't help but laughing. It's like Avra, Avram has a bit of a personality there, right? And we also have to the earlier question, who converted Sarai to monotheism? We have definitely an exploration of religious um, identity and belief between Sarah and her family, especially around Nimrod, uh, and the ways in which um, gods and humans are marrying and Sarah is arguing that that should not be the case. So as we see in this narrative, we have a situation in which Abraham and Sarah are coming from a, a cultural context in which much more indigenous and pagan practices were engaged in. Um, and this exploration of Sarah's personality is a very interesting um, window into who she could have been before they met, what her background is, what shaped her, all those questions that perhaps we as readers are thinking about and don't really have good answers to. Um, and often, you know, we might fill in those gaps. It's kind of like, I often joke that Midrash is in some way, like kind of like a Jewish way of exploring all of these possibilities for who these folks are because it makes them much more multidimensional. So I want to pause here and see if there are any comments for the chat. If folks want to comment verbally, um, would that be all right as well? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so um, if anyone wants to make a comment or has a question, and you can use the raise hand function. Okay, uh, D. Rohr Strauss. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I think these re the readings we're doing are a hoot, but I also think they diminish very seriously the Torah translations into English. I know they're different uh, Torah translations, etc. But somehow these readings diminish the, the, the Torah translations into English, even though they're very funny and cute. Could you say more about what you mean by they diminish the Torah translations? You're, you're muted still. Oh, okay. Maybe not. Uh, Judith. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, it's, it's written, you know, all these thoughts are, look, I know that, how can I put it? If one reads the Hebrew and then it gets translated, and even if the words are picked over, one gets a different feeling of the seriousness. This is written in a sort of, as though the, the author wants to be humorous. I mean, all these, there's some, that's how I see it. It's not taken as seriously by the author. Mm -hmm. these, of, that's what I think. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Judith? Yes, I had the opposite reaction. I love the addition of all the animals and later on there's a waterfall i did read it last night and the waterfall and the mosquitoes it brings a more earthy um context and i think it for me it enriches the story and makes it somewhat sensual and um romantic and um you know it's if you take it with a grain of salt that it's not the whole story or the true story. It's just gives you the thought, as Rabbi Tuckman was saying earlier, that it's a possibility. It's a possible interpretation and possible insight. Yes, and I appreciate both of these comments and I want to address them both and maybe we'll take a few more as well. Um, one of the challenges 
and this certainly comes up when I teach more modern midrashim, and I certainly struggle with this as well as somebody who is uh, has a um, particular orientation to text that tends to be more traditional. Um, one of the things that is an interesting thing to navigate is the question of seriousness and the question of how we interplay different stories with the actual texts of the Torah that we consider to be sacred in our tradition. Um, and however one understands Torah, however under one understands Torah mi Sinai uh, in a much more literal way that in fact, the entire Torah was given at Sinai. If one understands me, Sinai to be more figurative, if one does not believe the Torah was given at Sinai, whatever one's understanding therein is, it still can be really difficult to navigate what to do with a modern midrash um, that is in some ways playing a lot with the text and imagining possibilities for the biblical characters that we don't have in the actual text. Um, and to the point about translation, and then I'm gonna loop back around to this actual text. To the point about translation, translation I believe is in fact commentary. So when we're translating anything from one language to another, even if we are trying to be extraordinarily precise, we are inevitably inserting our own perspective into how we translate. Um, that's one of the reasons that in my view, having some access to original Hebrew is so important because when we're able to do that and we're able to dig into that, we get a much fuller rendering than if we're only looking at translation, especially given that there are so many different English translations and they are trans the translators who create those English translations are coming with their own biases and their own perspective. Um, so to loop back around to the actual text, to the point that Judith, you made about the earthiness of the text, uh, Rabbi Hammer is known for being someone very committed and passionate about earth-based Jewish spiritual practice. That is one of the things that she focuses on in Kohanet. That is one of the things she focuses on a lot in her classes, and that's been a part of her journey. Um, I don't know a lot about that journey, but I know that that is a part of it. And so that is naturally going to show up in her midrashim, right? Other um, authors of modern Midrash, if, you, if folks are interested, we're likely not going to look at it in this series, but there is a beautiful two-volume compilation called Dir Shuni, which is Israeli women's Midrash. There is an English volume forthcoming. Those Midrashim take a much more classical perspective on Midrash, and they adopt a classical form. That here is not the case. Rabbi Hammer says directly in her collection that these are tales. Right, so in one way or another, they can be seen as imaginative possibility, or as I'm using the term modern midrash, but they are also explicitly understood to be story and fictionalized exploration. So the, what we do with these is we explore what that might tell us about a thicker understanding of who these characters are, but what we have to be careful about is that they are not absolute and that they don't work for everyone. And that's totally okay, right? The different styles of midrash, different styles of exploration don't work for everyone. And I find that often with my own, with my own learning, that there are things that I read, um, even by people that I really generally admire. And I think to myself, yeah, this doesn't really settle with me. This feels too, this feels too trite, this feels too humorous, this feels too lacking in, sincer in sincerity. So however one approaches this, is that's completely legitimate for your own understanding and exploration. I'm bringing it here simply as one approach that we might take to a better understanding or a better sense or exploration of who our, who our matriarchs are. And then the next few sessions, we're going to be looking at much more traditional text. So I really wanna thank everyone and I wanna open it up to more comments if folks have more comments or reactions. Great. Yeah, three people have hands raised. So okay, we'll wonderful. Uh, yeah, we'll start with Lynn and then Andrew, followed by Barry and Jackie. So thank you. Um, so you know, it's interesting. I some of the midrashim, the traditional ones, I mean, they're pretty imaginative, but the traditional ones are written by men. And so this tale, you know, is a midrash to the point where it's so fleshed out, it's, it's fiction. But it reminds me of this book that I read recently, which I think probably most people have read, The Red Tent by Anita Diamond, which is this really elaborate 
fictional novel, but it's a midrash. It started with the tale of Dina, who we only hear her name once or twice, and then she's gone in the Torah. And it just, I'm very interested. The thing that's different about this is we're just not used to hearing midrashim from the point of view of women. Um, and it's sort of much more connected to nature and to the earth and to animals as living creatures than Jewish writing typically is. Um, so I just think, think it's really good for us to explore the feminist point of view um, and the female imagination more. And I like that. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Much appreciated. Um, Andrew? Thank you. Um... I like, the th I like the thoughts that are being put, given to me by these comments. What I wanted to just say is, um, as a younger Jew, I tended to be very Torah literate, and, e and any Midrash I just kind of rejected as, what's the source? Prove it to me. Why, why should I accept that versus anything else? I could make up something completely different that connects the dots. Um, and then, after studying Torah sort of cycle over cycle over cycle, I got very frustrated that they weren't, no one was coming out with book two, book three, book four. Um, I wanted more to know the detail. Um, and then that's where Midrash starts to fill in. But what's interesting to me right now is that the thought was given to me by what was said that I've always been frustrated by the fact that Midrash added in elements of the plot that I wasn't so sure if I was buying or not. Did I believe that that was really the way the plot would have gone? And today someone just made the point that there's a lot of, um, I think, emotion, personality, um, depth of character that's being filled in in this Midrash. And I don't know if that's the difference between modern Midrash versus what else you were referring to, um, the other category of Midrash, whatever that might be termed, or if it's just what I'm hearing um, that I haven't ever heard before, the idea that filling in character versus filling in plot is what Midrash does. Um, so I want, just wanted to share those thoughts because they're interesting for me to dwell on, but I'm not sure that I'm going to get definitive answer today, but there are three more sessions. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate that. Um, and we had one more. Didn't okay. we have one more coming? Yeah, Barry and Jackie, we actually have a, another hand if there's time after that, uh, Ellen. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, okay. I, one little detail that I thought was, you know, puzzling. Uh, they in the Bible, of course, they when God goes to Av Avram and tells him Lech Lecha, he's supposedly seventy-five years old. But yet in this midrash, he's a young man when he first meets Sarai. But he he alludes. He says to his father that how would why would she, why would, if she's a, a moon, daughter of a moon priestess, why would she want to go off with me to, to a wilderness, you know, and leave, and leave uh, or, and so he, at that point, he's already alluding that God had told him to leave and to go, and he's a young man, so it, it's kind of a discrepancy. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jackie. Yes, that is a very, that is a very interesting discrepancy there. And we had one other comment. Ellen? Ellen, you can go ahead, go ahead and unmute yourself. Say, I tried to post it. I don't know if it got posted. This uh, this story also gives Sarah a lineage and a context, which is not in this Torah. And I know there are very, there are gaps in the Torah narrative. So, and I think it's purposely put there. So God arranged it that way, or the writing is arranged it so we can fill in with our own narrative, which is enriches the Torah stories and keeps the conversation going for a few millennium. And is and is uh, and is apropos of the time because every time we see things differently yes thank you and in our last few moments before we close i want to address uh, a little bit of what i heard in those comments which were so um wonderful and riveting thank you all and i'm looking forward to continued learning in the next couple of weeks so the question about classical and modern midrash is such an important question um because you know, it is hard. There are there are those in the Jewish tradition. Uh, there are commentators and there are communities to this day for whom Midrash is as it is stated. 
So even though we know that in the Torah, the story of Avram and Tarach and the idols and the idols is not there, that that is part of rabbinic tradition and that is understood to have happened in as much as anything else in the written text. So oral, so oral tradition um, is, is as sacred for many, many traditional folks as is the written Torah. And so when we're playing with modern Midrash, when we're in that space, we have to hold a lot of different things. I think about this a lot when it comes to the Red Tent. I read that book years and years ago. And it is an extremely elaborate, imaginative, fictionalized account. And there was a lot of pushback. There's a lot of pushback from folks who said, you're playing fast and loose with this holy Torah, and you're making up this entire universe of women and how women's tradition gets passed down. And it's, it's hard because we're not used to it. We're not, as was said, we're not used to this. And, you know, even I, when I read the Red Tent, there are lots of parts, there are parts of the Red Tent that I was just like, I can't, I can't follow you there, right? But what I had to do in that experience as a reader of text was to say, okay, what is Anita Diamond doing? What is her explorative, pro what is her imaginative process in this moment? What is the message being passed down? And really having to, take multi-layered approaches. And I, as I read and we read that book, I went through the same experience. And that's often how I experience Midrash as well, both classical and contemporary. Now with the classical Midrashim, they were often recite, they were often um, spoken about in the Beit Knesset, in the synagogues. So Midrashim became compiled into a variety of collections, but they were often the basis of sermons. And they were things that your average Jew knew. Right? They may not have been literate in Talmud, they may not have been literate in Mishnah, but the stories, particularly in Akkadic Midrashim, were things that people absolutely knew. And they do enrich the plot and create more of an ongoing conversation, but it's also, it can be seen as a very deeply traditional and rigorous and loving way of exploring and study, because the, Midr the uh, rabbinic tradition understands that study is, in, in and of itself, service of God, that when we study Torah in all of its variations, we are in fact engaging in an act of avodat Hashem, of service of God. And so when in our contemporary era, we have a lot of different folks writing Midrashim, we, when we learn those Midrashim, we get to ask our, ourselves the questions of, how is this landing for me? Is this enhancing how I understand Sarah? What is it opening? What kind of avenues is it opening? And what kind of ways am I feeling really challenged? And is this something that I buy or not? And, you know, a lot of times you can just set something down and say, I'm glad I've learned it and move forward. That's often how I think about learning Torah, that, you know, we learn from everything we are exposed to, even when we realize that that to which we have been exposed is not something that resonates with us spiritually or emotionally or religiously. And so in the next couple of sessions, I'm going to be bringing in many more different kinds of texts. We might look more at this book. We might actually look at other things. Um, but we're going to be experiencing a range of not only classical perspective, but also women's perspective on the Imahot. So with that, we're going to wrap up here. And I want to thank everyone for joining um, us today for this first session. And the next two are at the same time on the 17th and the 24th. I'm now going to pass it back to Julie for any closing remarks.